Jon Stewart loves to stick it to Fox News, and in classic finger-in-the-eye fashion, he especially likes to do it while appearing on Fox News. His latest sparring partner wasn't Bill O'Reilly, but Chris Wallace, who had a career at ABC and NBC before joining Rupert Murdoch's network. So when Stewart ripped Fox as a forum for Republican propaganda, the host of Fox News Sunday pushed back, saying his network is a counterweight to the liberalism of the New York Times and other mainstream outlets. Stewart wasn't buying. Do you think I get marching orders? I think that you are here, in some respects, to uh, bring a credibility and an integrity to an organization that might not otherwise have it without your presence. So you, you, uh, also, you are here as a counterweight to Hannity, let's say, or you are here as a counterweight to Glenn Beck, because otherwise it's just pure talk radio, and it doesn't establish the type of well, the, political so play you, that it but wants the, so to be. Part, I, I don't agenda. think our viewers are the least bit disappointed with us. I think our viewers think, finally, right. they're getting somebody who tells the other side right. of the story. And one, in, and no, no, in no, no, the polls, no, no. One more, who one is more the example. most consistently misinformed media viewers? The most consistently misinformed? Fox. Fox viewers. Consistently. Can every poll. Joining us now to talk about the comedian's latest indictment in New York, Linus McNichol, media editor at the website Business Insider. Here in Washington, David Zurich, television and media critic for the Baltimore Sun. And in Kansas City, Aaron Barnhart, who writes the TV Barn blog for the Kansas City Star. David Zurich, did Jon Stewart make the case that Fox peddles right-wing propaganda, or was he just being entertaining? Uh, I, don't, I don't think he made the case at all. Um, you know, he, he, he's told Brett Baer that he's, he approves of him. He's told Bill O'Reilly he approves of him. Now he's told Chris Wallace he approves of him. So how do you get a 100% 24-7 propaganda machine if you've got three of their biggest stars are people he approves of? I think that segment that showed him saying Fox viewers are consistently misinformed. The bite you had was terrific. And then saying every poll shows this well, to be true. That was a mistake and we're gonna come back to that, okay. but let me turn to Glennis McNichol. Did Chris Wallace do an effective job of defending Fox News or did he concede that the network is kind of set up to battle the mainstream media when he said we tell the other side? I'm not sure he did as an effective job as he could. At one point he pulled out a six-year-old clip from Comedy Central. He seemed to sort of use the entire Comedy Central network against Jon Stewart, even though Jon Stewart obviously just hosts a half an hour show. The, the point Jon Stewart, I think, was trying to make was that Chris Wallace said, we show the other side, and in, in, in that conceded that Fox shows the conservative side. But I mean, I don't know that Chris Wallace needed to do an effective job. His viewership is obvi are obviously fans of Fox News. Right, so right. I, well, I'm Chris not sure Wallace, who he needed to convince. Chris Wallace later said that uh, he perhaps not the best choice of phrase, the other side. Of course, mm -hmm. they would say they cover both sides. But Aaron Barnhart, clue me in here. Why would Wallace invite Stewart on to rip Fox News, knowing full well that that's what he was going to do? Well, I think, as he said in his intro, Howie, he, he wanted to, you know, they're a fair and balanced network, and, ah. and this is what a fair and balanced network does, right? It has, it, it presents both sides to the story, but, you know, I, I just found the whole conversation a little bit dishonest. There was a lot of debating about ideology, and there was that line about being a comedian is harder than what I do, and if, if you were tree, would you be Mark Twain? And I, I went back and I looked at the, the tape, or I should say the web video. And by the way, I, we should probably make clear here we're not talking about what aired last week on Fox News Sunday, but what everybody watched and is commenting on the web, the longer unedited version of it. No, the statement and, about, so anyway, uh, I went, I went, about Fox News did air the statement that Stewart made about and them in fact, being since, that's since, since, since you've both that's right, to this but point. He said, let me just jump in. He said in something and, about Bill Sr., the Fox News Channel executive, yeah, Bill yeah. Sr., that got bleeped, yeah. from got, got bleeped from the Fox. Right. Well, you say bleeped. I mean, the, uh, the, the interview was edited. I want to come back to that point, too. But first, let me play Jon Stewart uh, acknowledging that he had made a mistake when he made this uh, argument that polls showed the Fox viewers were the most uh, misinformed. Let's roll that. Ultimately, PolitiFact declared my statement false. Uh, I defer to their judgment. And I apologize for my mistake. Fox said, less than 10% of Obama's cabinet appointees have worked in the private sector. PolitiFact says that's false. Fox said, White House political director once served as right-hand man to the acorn chief. PolitiFact scored that as false. 
So having made that mistake, was that an effective comeback? Obviously it went on and on. We haven't showed the whole thing. It was effective for his supporters. I counted 21 errors that he went through by the time he was spitting trail mix out of his mouth. It was, as, as comedy, it was a very funny thing. But as a media critic, Howie, this is what drives me crazy about Jon Stewart. So many of my colleagues think he's a great media critic and take anything he says as the truth. Listen, if what he did was this, this would be the New York Times on their correction page saying, well, we made a mistake and we're sorry for it, but the Wall Street Journal made 21 mistakes. They're worse than us. We're well, good. Forgive us. In fact, Chris Wallace quoted you, quoted oh, David Zewer during the uh, interview and said, uh, you having said, Stewart has never been held accountable in his media yes. criticism. Yes, yes. All right, hold him accountable. It's, well, it, that's, a, that's a case of it right there. I'll tell you another uh, case of it. When he attacks CNN for its coverage of Anthony Weiner's press conference where he called the CNN producer a jackass, horrible display. Dana Bash and that producer were doing exactly what journalists should be doing, and they were doing it politely. Dana Bash was the adult there who kept saying, well, I know you're upset, but just answer this. He calls him a jackass, and Jon Stewart makes fun of CNN. That's Jon Stewart's kind of media criticism. And a week later, when Weiner says, this is all true, I was lying to you, Where's Jon Stewart? He pulls his punch right. in that Monday night show. Let's try to elevate this from the jackass category by going back to Glennis McNichol. Uh, was that an effective response by Jon Stewart to say, well, I screwed up, but you're far worse? And, and what do you make of Zurich's point that we, he's overly celebrated as a, a media uh, critic? Well, let's just start with, I think Jon Stewart going on Fox is genius for both of them because it's good TV. Was his response effective? Absolutely. I mean, it, it was right down the line, a quintessential John Stewart response. Okay, I'm wrong. Let's turn this into a sharp, funny segment about why Fox is so bad because it's so easy and fun to demonize Fox, particularly for his audience. Uh, I do think, you know, David has a point. I think Stewart manages to take the most ridiculous aspect of cable news and turn it into an entertaining show. And sometimes that means he's an effective media critic, and sometimes that means he's just very effective uh, comedian or satirist. So I think it's hard you know, to separate the two sometimes. And he does get a pass. He's so entertaining. You're never disappointed when he watches this show. Let me, let me have uh, Aaron Barnhart uh, break the tie here because, uh, <laughs> look, he, Stewart admits that he's a comedian first, but he obviously uses comedy and satire in order to make serious points, including skewering the media and often Fox. Yeah, and I think he sees himself doing the job that a lot of mainstream people won't do, which is to punch back. And you know what's really interesting? Sometimes when you hit the bully, he respects you. And, and I would refer people to the uh, video of his interview with Bill O'Reilly to go back and watch that because what starts to happen is what didn't happen with Chris Wallace. You know, where Chris Wallace was sort of sticking to his guns and throwing out lines that, you know, arguments that could have been made three, four years ago. John Stewart and Bill O'Reilly had a really reasonable discussion once they got done sort of hitting each other a couple times back and forth. But I thought they had a really excellent conversation about news judgment and the way it's exercised, why uh, Fox News goes wall to wall uh, attacking the Obama White House on Common but won't go after Ted Nugent. I just thought that, that it felt right. to me like a conversation among peers and equals, and we didn't have that last week. That's not what John Chris Stewart Wallace. said. John Stewart said he was so badly edited, he looked like a woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown during the whole thing. That was yeah. his well, morning after can assessment. I just, can I just point out that The Daily Show edits interviews, and Fox, mm -hmm. by putting the complete 24 minutes, whatever it was, Wallace said Stewart was filibustering, yeah, exactly. online, we all got to see it and make our own judgment. Yes, yes you'd agree with that? Right, we yes. have a rare <laughs> moment of agreement. That means it's time for me to get a break. Up next. Countdown is back on the air. Can Keith Oberman lure the liberals from MSNBC to Al Gore's network? Days until the 2012 presidential election. It was hard to miss the fact that Keith Oberman returned to television this week thanks to a high-profile publicity campaign for his debut on Current TV. And it was hard to miss the fact that Countdown looked and sounded pretty much the same as it did during Oberman's eight years on MSNBC until their bitter breakup earlier this year. And as the liberal commentator made clear, he is still a man with a mission. This is to be a newscast of contextualization, and it is to be presented with a viewpoint. 
that the weakest citizen of this country is more important than the strongest corporation, that the nation is losing its independence through the malfeasance of one political party and the timidity of another, and that even though you and I should not have to be the last line of defense, apparently we are. So we damn well better start being it. Glennis McNichol, did you see a different Keith Oldman in his role as last line of defense or the same old guy? I, I think I basically saw the same show on a different channel. And I think, you know, Olbermann and Kern are banking on the fact that his loyal viewers from MSNBC have missed his show since January, are going to follow him to this new station to see him again. Not that they're presenting something new or different or anything all that, you know, spectacularly original from what they had at MSNBC. David Zurich, you've been critical of Oldman over the years at times, but mostly you gave his debut a positive review. I, I was really impressed with the production values, and I think his leadership. He really produced a show that looks better than I think it did on MSNBC, and for that I think he deserves high praise. I don't know what kind of infrastructure he's working with in terms of facilities and that, but they really did well this week. The thing I didn't like, Howie, and really troubled me was this rhetoric he has of insult and rancor calling people uh, idiots, and uh, half an idiot he called Sarah Palin, I want to be, and morons, calling people morons. That's what has always troubled me about Keith Oberman. I hope Al Gore, the half owner of that network, will rein him in. Uh, but he, it is an attractive show, it really is. I think uh, Oldman was hired to be Oldman. I thought he kind of toned it down a notch, even while doing Worst Persons in the World, which he had flirted with giving up a couple of times. MSNBC, Aaron Barnhart. Oldman talked uh, both on the show and in the run-up about being free of the corporate constraints of working for an organization like NBC. Did he seem to you to be liberated uh, on this new network? Uh, I didn't see him uh, really... Uh throwing those shackles off in any significant <laughs> rhetorical way. And he spent the last three months, you know, uh, being asked this question, what was it that MSNBC management did that you were trying to get out from under? And he had three months to give an answer. I never thought he really particularly gave a very helpful answer. Uh, you know, in the show, you saw the same guests. You saw Jonathan Turley, you saw John Dean, you saw the Eminem brothers, Michael Moore, Marcos Melitzas. And so going forward, uh, my question is, uh, now that you've promoted yourself as being, you know, free from the man, what does that mean? Uh, what exactly are you going to be doing with this show that you weren't doing this show? But I, I should say that for the purposes of this first week, maybe even this first month, it was absolutely vital that Keith Olbermann get his audience moved over to uh, uh, current. And with 175,000 viewers in the young adult demographic, twice what CNN was doing in that hour, by the way, Howie, uh, I think he succeeded. Well, you know, that's another uh, an interesting aspect of it. You know, Current, like a lot of stations do this, released selective Nielsen figures. They wouldn't release the total yes, viewers. Yes, only gave us that one demo, which was sure to be their best number. Now that's what corporations do. That's what these evil corporations that he's going to rail against, this ten million dollar a year anchor man who's the little people's friend, that's what he's going to do. And he's doing it. You know, I wrote a piece Although that to be, give to us be fair a little to transparency. It, to be fair, Tell us what the ratings are. To be fair are. to Olbermann here. Well, yeah, and he's making ten million dollars a year too. That's, that's corporate money. Yes. Uh, but what I was going to say Thank is, uh, uh, when you're looking at that, that y those young audience demos, uh, I think that's important and shouldn't be skipped over. You know, the one thing that Jon Stewart does that none of these cable news channels do is he draws a crowd of people under the age of 40 and talks to them about things that interest you and me and all these other people who work in the media. But Aaron, Journalism you heard him stories, say, stories like you heard him say this was going to be a newscast of contextualization. Well, you can't just give just one number and not the other right, ones get, that let contextualize me get, Let me it. get some context from Glynis. Uh, you know, it's true, as Aaron says, that Oldman has always chafed against the man, whether it was at ESPN or MSNBC. Now he is the man. He's the chief <laughs> news officer at, at Current TV. Uh, will he have the same impact six months or a year from now as he had on the bigger network? Here's the thing. When you watched his show on MSNBC, did you ever get the sense that he was chafing against the man, that he was not being allowed to say things that he wanted to say? I mean, I never I got he said the whatever sense. the hell he wanted. <laughs> I know, exactly. You never got the sense that there was this sort of Keith Olbermann waiting to be unleashed, you know? So the fact that he's moved to current, we're getting, I feel like 
we're, we're not getting anything new that, in fact, we, viewers never really got the sense that he was being held back and needed to go somewhere different, unless you read his Twitter sometimes, which is, is a little angrier than perhaps what you get on the show. There, 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 there was one change where he pulled back. He had to be going three or four minutes past the mm -hmm. hour in an effort to kind of stick at the MSNBC. He now says he's not going to do that anymore because his friend Rachel Maddow uh, yeah. would be hurt by that. I thought Typical that was interesting because he really... Typical Oberman. I'm going to... Okay. He was listening, A, to fans, and B, I think he's, he's been trying to demonize MSNBC and sort of make them the enemy that he's playing off of. And it clearly, in the first week, didn't work, and he, and he pulled back and sort of said, oh, right. know, Rachel Maddow's my friend now. We'll, we'll keep watching and talking about it on this program. David Zorick, Linus McNichol, Aaron Barnhart, thanks very much for stopping by.